night will be Anna Castle. Anna Castle writes two historical series so far. Francis Bacon Mystery and the Professor and Mrs. Moriarty Moriarty Moriarty. <laughs> My mouth doesn't work right. <laughs> um, she's earned a series of degrees, a BA in classics, an MS in computer science, and a PhD in linguistics, and has had a corresponding series of careers, including waitressing, software engineering, assistant professor, and archivist. Writing fiction combines her lifelong love of stories and learning. Please join me in welcoming Anna. Alrighty, I had to add that to my dictionary. <laughs> Just type it all the time. So I'm going to start with chapter two because it's a little bit funnier and it has a little bit of poetry in it. Um, this is uh, from Publish and Parish. I just uh, published this book in June, middle of June. It's uh, the fourth in the Francis Bacon Mystery Series. And in chapter one, we just opened with Francis Bacon and his assistant, Thomas Clarity, who's the point of view in this uh, chapter, um, sitting in their study chamber uh, talking about a, a, a religious controversy of interest at the time. This is the big thing in Elizabethan England, of course, is religious controversy, so, which I personally find hilarious. <laughs> Some of my murder mysteries are all this sort of humorous take on religious controversy. Like, what are they fighting about? So, all right. As soon as the door closed, Tom jumped up and sprinted into the bedchamber to look out the window on the south side of the house. He watched Bacon walk around the corner and disappear into the passageway leading to Hobburn Road. Good. He'd be gone for at least an hour, possibly two. Lord Burley never admitted anyone the minute he arrived. It would look like he had nothing else to do. Bacon hadn't invented that little ploy. No, the Lord Treasurer would let his nephew cool his heels in the portico for at least half an hour. They'd talk for half an hour. Bacon would be sure they did. Every minute, standing near the seat of power, counted. Tom returned to his desk, unearthed the folded square paper, and slipped it into his sleeve. Then he jogged down the stairs to his room at the back of the house, which he had moved into at the end of Trinity term when his former chambermaid went home to get married. Lady Russell paid the excessive rent from Tom's estate. Heaven forbid that so much as a stray groat should fall into Tom's misruly hands. Never mind. Where there was a will, there was a way. He'd found the means of earning a few shillings, enough to visit his favorite doxy every other week and treat his friends to a jug or two at the tavern once in a while. A man must enjoy some pleasures, or what's it all for? He pulled off his legal robes and changed into his city shoes, passable but sturdy and easily cleaned. He changed his plain black hat for one with a wide brim and a flouncy feather that somewhat hid his face. <laughs> Lady Russell might require him to dress in black, her favorite color, from head to toe, but she had an eye for quality. His doublet and round hose, while soberly trimmed, were made of finest broadcloth and fitted him to perfection. She considered him her representative as well as, she considered him her representative as well as Bacon's. He doubted either would be much pleased with his next, next assignation. While he was faster than waiting for a wary these days, Tom took the shortest route to St. Paul's Cathedral, glad for the chance to stretch his long legs. He entered through the great south doors and shouldered through the crowd of light skirts, coney catchers, <coughs> pockets, and masterless men working the ever-flowing stream of fresh prey, newly arrived from wherever such innocents were grown. In these hallowed halls of vice and thievery, Tom was almost glad to have an empty purse. He took up his station on the far side of Duke Humphrey's tomb and hadn't long to wait before his best customer, a draper's apprentice with a passion for a mercer's daughter, sidled up. Do you have it? I do. Tom drew the paper square from his sleeve and unfolded it. He exhibited the page in his flawless script, then cleared his throat and read aloud. To my darling lettuce, captor of my heart and queen of my desires, I humbly beg you receive with a kind and pitiful regard this fervent cry from within the very depths of my soul. That's beautiful, the apprentice moaned, clasping his hands to his chest. Won't you read the verse too, Mr. Veritas? You always add a little flourish. I do my best to imitate it. Tom signed his poems Valentine Veritas in honor of his father, who had the same first name. Tush, it's nothing. Tom set one fist on his hip and held up the page with the other hand, so of course he knew the verse by heart. He lowered his pitch so his voice would carry through the dull roar of the noise inside the cathedral. Oh, fair sweet face, oh, eyes celestial bright, twin stars in heaven that now beguile my sight. Oh, fruitful lips where cherries ever grow, and damask cheeks like peaches soft as snow. I beg of you, my fairest lettuce, that never, ever you forget us. 
and grant me this one honeyed kiss to hold me in undying bliss. The apprentice gaped at Tom in thunder-stricken admiration. Tom never got tired of this part. Even better, the youth added sixpence to the usual fee of six shillings. Your money seems so inadequate. He sighed. Could you do me another one next week, same time? I shall summon the muse. <coughs> Tom undid a hook in his doublet to add the coins to his purse and tucked it well out of sight again. Man could not be too careful in this place. Will it still be lettuce, do you think? Of course, she's the light of my life. The apprentice paused and added, if it isn't, I'll send you a note. He touched the brim of his cap and skipped off to pitch his woo. Tom wished him luck. He also wished the man would fall in love with a woman whose name was easier to rhyme, like Grace or Mary. <laughs> <laughs> clarity, clarity, selling wretched verses to apprentices? How are the mighty fallen? The mocking voice came from behind Duke Humphrey's tomb. I beg of you, my fairest lettuce, that never ever you forget us. I should charge you six shillings for the damage to my ears. <laughs> what? Tom turned on his heel and met the impish grin of his sometime friend from Cambridge University, Thomas Nash. The scrawny poet looked newly prosperous in a green doublet that almost fit and a matching hat whose crown had not yet been broken. His straw blonde hair still needed trimming and he hadn't managed to sprout any on his chin, though he was only a month younger than Tom. The lack of that manly ornament gave Nash a perpetually boyish air, belied by the shrewdness of his sand-colored eyes. Nashy, Tom cried gladly, clapping him on the shoulders. What brings you to London? I am now an inhabitant of this fair city, soon to become one of its most renowned quillsmen. I came down from Cambridge in May, choosing to avoid the crush of those tiresome graduation ceremonies. No master's degree? I am my own master, that's sufficient degree for me. But what's new with you? Where's the dashing lad in the green hose and yellow stockings? You look like you're on your way to the funeral, to a funeral. Who died? My father. Nash's mocking laughter died at once. I am truly sorry. I know how much you loved him. How did it happen? Tom's answer was cut off by a staggering oaf who must have weighed 15 stone, roaring curses at another of his tribe, drowning out all hope of conversation. Tom cocked his head toward the north doors. They made their way out and walked over to a time-worn tomb standing under an ancient yew tree. Moss grew in the dank dirt around its base, and birds had made free with its roughened surface. A couple of wastrels leaned against it. Tom shooed them away. Nash hopped up and made himself comfortable, heedless of his clothes. Tom pulled out a large handkerchief and spread it over the spotted surface before gingerly setting himself down. Fastidious, aren't you? Tom shrugged. Not walking about the city with bird shit speckling my arse. <laughs> a fair point. Now I shot Tom a sidelong glance and said, tell me about your father. Did he fall in the battle against the Spanish Armada? Tom's father had been a privateer, captain of his own ship and more successful than most. He'd relieved the Spanish of many a rich cargo and had the sense to invest his takings in land, building an estate worth 600 per annum, not counting his widow's portion. He'd been determined to hoist his only son into the ranks of the gentry, getting him into Gray's Inn by finding a member of the governing board with a burden of debt and paying it off. That member happened to be Francis Bacon. He survived the battles, Tom said, with his ship intact and most of his crew as well. He came to London for a week last September in hopes of finding some supplies. There wasn't much, but I got to see him. Then he sailed to France in search of shot and powder, planning to sail out to harass the Spanish fleet on their way home. He found enough to fill his hold. Somehow it caught fire and blew his ship into the skies, killing him and his quartermaster. Fortunately, no one else was aboard. He was a hero, Nash said. He died in defense of our queen and our liberty, the same as if he'd been facing a Spanish galleon in the German sea. Tom nodded. They sat in silence for a few minutes, enjoying the shade. Sparrows twittered overhead, and people's voices sounded all around them, from shoppers visiting the bookstalls on the north wall of the cathedral. What will you do now, Nash said. Will you stay on a Gray's Inn and become a barrister? You're your own man now, like me. I'll stay the course my father set for me. I would anyway, but I have no choice. I'm not my own man. I belong to Lady Elizabeth Russell as surely as if she bought me at an auction. How's that? My father's father bought manors that once belonged to Tarrant Abbey, not far from our house in Dorset. A wise purchase, but little did we know that any lands that once belonged to the old church still owe night service to the crown. That duty sticks to the <coughs> land like burrs in a rough cloak. Night service? That sounds like something you'd like, galloping around the countryside rescuing damsels. Although I expect these days they just extract a healthy fine and send you on your merry way. The damsels, I mean. Nash couldn't say rational for too long at a stretch. 
If I had gained my majority before my father lost his life, I missed it by three months. Since a minor can't perform night service, however ceremonial, I became a ward of the queen, and my estate fell under the jurisdiction of the court of wards. <coughs> that doesn't sound good. It isn't, trust me. The market in wardships is hotter than the Spanish main in August. Anyone with cash in the house and an eye for a good investment sends a messenger galloping to Westminster to place their bid, especially for an estate as large as mine. Nash whistled. Remind me to ask you for a loan next time I come up short. Speaking of which, you don't think I get any of it, do you? I'm the infant, as the legal documents describe us. No one gives money to an infant. Anyway, there are people watching out for news of rich boards and bidding starts early. My master, Francis Bacon, I remember him. He's the one who wrote all those pithy letters while you were up at Cambridge. The same. We were together when I got the news. His uncle is the master of the court of wards, and he knows the sorts of people most likely to win the prize. He did his best, I do believe, going straight to his aunt, Lady Russell, so she could get her bid in first. Since she's Lord Burley's sister-in-law, she had the advantage. Nash held up a hand and pretended to calculate a sum on his fingers. Let me get this straight. Your master, Francis Bacon, is the nephew of your guardian, Lady Russell, who is the aunt, sister-in-law, Tom corrected, of the master of wards, who is also Mr. Bacon's uncle, and also to cap it all, the Lord Treasurer in the Queen's right hand. Phew! Nash pulled off his hat and fanned himself with it crimping the brim in his sweaty palm. You have risen into exalted circles. I'd be afraid to sit next to you if I didn't have the tomb of this poor churl to raise me up a bit. I think it's Ethelred. Who is who? The name inside the tomb. I think it's Ethelred the Unready. Nash twisted around, lifting up half his arse in an attempt to read the worn lettering. More likely, Ethelflad the Unwilling. She died of shame after hearing her name rhymed with red, mad, and trod in the same verse. <laughs> Tom laughed. Leave it to Thomas Nash to turn a serious moment into foolery. Does anybody have any questions for Emma? I do. Okay, so how do you do your research? Oh, I am hopelessly addicted to the Elizabethan period. I don't do as much now per book. But uh, when I wrote the first book, I had an office in the PCL at UT, so on the third floor where oh, uh, all my history jealous. books are. So I just gobbled it up, gobbled it up, and have read hugely. I guess my, my novel bibliography is like 10 times, an order of magnitude larger than my dissertation bibliography. It's so much more fun. <laughs> it's more fun to read than the privileged purposes. So now for this, I read a couple of books about the Martin Marprelate controversy, which is a a pamphlet war that this revolves around. It's like Martin Marplet wrote these scurrilous pamphlets against the Church of England. They were just horrible. They were hilarious. They were rude. They were witty. They were profound in terms of the Protestant, uh, the Calvinist agenda, and uh, and they they just lambasted the Archbishop and the whole Church of England. The, the government tried to suppress it. Man, it was like, no, 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 we've got to put a stop to it. And they couldn't catch them. They were just throwing these things out. It's just one of the things I love about the Elizabethan period is how draconian their laws were and how incapable uh, they were of actually uh, carrying them out. Carrying them out. Yeah. <laughs> they couldn't catch people. So anyway, Martin was never identified. Actually, there's a, a guy, in the, a historian in the, at the end of the last century, in the 19-somethings, uh, 1990 or maybe around 2000 even, uh, made a really good case, published a book, making the best possible case. So now people are pretty well accepting his argument, but it's not definitive, so I have my own idea. <laughs> anyway, a long answer. That was a good answer. But for each book, it's nice, because you advertised that research. Yeah. I'm sorry? Can I borrow you? Your office in the PCL never told me. And I was long gone. <laughs> I saw the library card though, because I, I, I left his staff. I Did you say you left the purse over there? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, oh my God. Oh, that's such a valuable thing. No, you know, when I retired, I thought about uh, leaving. I could go anywhere, right? In principle, I could go anywhere. But my UTID is so valuable here and it's worthless anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? What's your writing process? Oh, well, I am a plotter. Okay. So I'm about to start it, actually, coming up. And so I'm going to, um, at the end of this, last week of this month, I'm going to start reading for the next book, which will be a Moriarty book. I'm pretty disciplined. And I've, this, I've written a lot of books. So the more you write, the more you kind of you get wise to yourself, I think, more than anything else. And so that's how your process, uh, you know, if you're on a publication schedule, you've got to do something about your process. Kara may have a completely different view on this. 
But anyway, uh, so in August, I will read uh, what I need to for the Victorian period. I, again, I'm, I'm absorbed a lot already about culture and all that, so I'm going to read specifically about the theater world and, uh, and plot, my plot for the uh, third Moriarty book, which is called Moriarty Brings Down the House. And uh, I often think of a title that I like, and that, that's where. But this is with Bacon. I'm like, I look at the next year in his life and say, so what happened that tickles my fancy in that year? Yeah. And so then uh, I write a first. So I have a plot. So that's a scene list for me. It's a list of all the scenes. I've discovered that I can only plot like halfway through, uh, and have a good solid set of scenes for half the book. I use the Vice Snyder Save the Cat. It's very oh, yeah. yeah, non-literate. Love that. It's so much fun. And for mysteries, it's really, really a good structure. Uh, so anyway, I can get to the midpoint. And then uh, uh, that used to frustrate me that I couldn't get farther with the plotting, but it doesn't anymore because now I'm used to it. And so I get there, and I just take a week, and I plot the rest of the book. Because by that time, I know. And, and I usually have some landmarks coming out. And I all, always have the denouement, oddly enough. I know how it ends. Uh, and then the uh, first draft is, you know, it's just Nothing makes that better. <laughs> but I can write 2K a day. And I, I, that, again, is the more you do, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you just cut out that agonizing and the screwing around, and it's actually not that hard. And so then you just, because it's the first draft, right? It's supposed to be crap. And that, <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it's like, OK, fine. I just wrote a chapter that stinks, but so what? I've said what had to be said. And language is the easiest thing to fix. So absolutely don't agonize that until the story's told. And then you get to the end. And then, uh, you know, I take a couple of days to do something else and then print it on and sit at my kitchen table and uh, analyze draft two, I mean, that draft, like, with my notes from my scene list, which I keep while I'm going. So I'll think, oh my god. I, should have put his shoes under the bed in chapter three. So I just stick a note in my scene list. No, never look back. Never look back. You can spend the rest of your life editing the first three chapters. <laughs> yeah. So never ever look back until you get to the end. And you, that's why you have to have the note thing, the way of keeping track of what you're supposed to do. So you put all that together and do draft two, and then that goes to my editor. So I'm still tickering. The hardest thing about being indie is scheduling your editing. It is actually the very hardest thing. If you make it too tight, I'm supposed to be a retired person having fun, right? I am not supposed to glue my butt to my chair for months on end. You know, I told my mother, I've, I've got a gun to my head and I'm the one holding it. She'd actually didn't think that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it's no good, it's no good. So now I've decided, okay, when I get to the end of draft one, then I'm gonna book my uh, content editing. And that'll be like two months out. Good editors, you know, they're busy. And that's good, because that gives me plenty of time to do my draft too. I don't have to be rushed on that. And then I can write a couple of short stories. And that's ideal, because then I have completely forgotten about this book by the time I get it back to my editor. So I don't think it's true anymore, which makes it easier for me to edit it. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. and so that, that's really important. So my new thing that I like to say is that revenge is not the only dish that's best served cold. <laughs> <laughs> I think draft two is another one. And, uh, and so then, once you get it, that, that back, that's never a lot by this time. She's edited all my books, and, uh, and she specializes in historical fiction. So then we're, it's never a lot. It's taken me a few days to turn around, maybe a week at most. And then copy editing, which we schedule when we do content editing. And then she's doing the cover in there, too, somewhere. And so then all the rest just rolls down the hill. And then I'm free, and I like to do screw around. Uh, and then I'm now discovered the short story, so I'm having short story intervals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>